I challenge anyone, including Democrats and Republicans, to read this book cover to cover. And if you still vote for them after reading this book, well, then you're the problem, not the solution. Because I don't know when you read this book how anyone could possibly vote for them with the corruption that we expose in this book. I'm here with the Jesse Ventura with uh, your new book. Maybe the most creative title, The Democrips and Re Read Blood, Blood Lickings. Lickings. <laughs> You're good at that. Read Blood and even and have the key a, titles at the bottom, No More Gangs in Government. And yeah. Gangs you know of. I mean, you were a member back in the day, right, of the Mongol Motorcycle Club. That's right. right. So, so I, when I had my youth, I was third in command uh, of the South Bay chapter of the Mongols Motorcycle Club. So I know gangs and I know political parties. Right. Now so what, the, what do them. the Mongols have in common with the Democrats and the Republicans? Everything. They're set up identical. When you're in a gang, loyalty is to the gang first. Second loyalty is to how the gang makes money. That's their loyalty. The party first, the party donors second. Where do we, the people, fit in? Third or fourth, maybe? This move to parties as gangs, is that a natural evolution of political parties? Is it just something that has happened? I think power. that they end up growing into a monster. I think if you read chapter two, you'll find that I have three pretty good allies who oppose political parties. Washington, and that's George Washington, Washington yep. Tom Jefferson, and John Adams, pretty good allies who created this country, especially Washington. He had nothing good to say about political parties. Maybe initially they're like a good thing. People that with like-minded thinking band together, you know, much like a union, right. you know, to accomplish things. But I think they grow into the monster that they are today. And today there's only no one recourse, in my opinion, to save the country, and that is to abolish the political parties. Right, because you're even talking about no third parties. I mean, you, of course, got elected as a reform party, third party candidate, yep. and now you're saying that doesn't work either. No, and the reason why, any third party in which to compete is going to have to corrupt themselves. Mm -hmm. So you've already got a two-headed monster. Why would you want a three-headed one? Right. And the first step we could take, it's such a simple one, and it could be done at the local level with local ordinance, remove their names from the ballot. Mm -hmm. Why do we have Democrat and Republican on the ballot? That's done for their purposes. Mm -hmm. Because then you as a voter, if you're conservative, you don't have to know the candidate. You look for that word Republican, and that's the one you hit. If you're liberal, you look for Democrat. If you remove those names, then it becomes inherent for the voter to educate themselves. What does John Smith stand for? Now, the parties could still exist. They could endorse the same way the teachers' union endorses, the firemen's union would endorse. You could still gain the endorsement of this political you still, machinery. You could still caucus in, in a legislature with parties. If, though. well, yeah, I guess. And that's I another mean, what, thing. That that's another happen? simple thing. Seat everybody alphabetical. They don't do that, do they? It's one gang on one side of the aisle, the other gang on the other side of the aisle. Ah, eh, remove that. Seat everybody alphabetically. Do you see yourself running for office again? If a grassroots movement started in this country and they got me ballot access in all 50 states, and if they could guarantee me through the movement I could participate in the debates, I will run in 2016. That, is that a promise or a threat? It's both. <laughs> uh, and, and, but you never say you certainly could because certainly things could happen in my life that could stop me from doing it. What if I became ill? What if I got cancer or something of that nature? But uh, you have to have the debate access. I proved that in Minnesota. When they set these standards, like nationally now it's 15 percent, you got to be polling. That's a bunch of garbage. Because at the primary in Minnesota, I was polling 10 percent. Seven weeks later, I was the governor because I was allowed to debate. See, in Minnesota, you have major party status with 5%. So we had major so party was, status. So 5% was the threshold. Well, and I proved you could win at 10% seven weeks later. Well, I can see that's that. why they don't want, that's why what'll happen, they'll keep lifting the bar. If you qualify at 15, then they'll raise it to 18. Anything to keep you out. Now, here's a point to you, and especially here at Forbes, which is a great private sector company. Why do we encourage competition in the private sector and yet we discourage it in the public sector? We haven't had a third candidate up there talking for president now in 20 years mm -hmm. since Perot. Ross Perot in sure. 1992. That's 20 years ago. Get where I'm going? Mm -hmm. 
Why, you know, in the private sector, they tell you competition's good. Public sector, I guess it's bad, isn't it?